we had um, this sound playing in our workspace nine years ago when we started with the whole My Taxi project. For every completed tour, it went like <coughs> because we're building this um, this taxi application. On the left hand side, you can see the the passenger app. On the right hand side, the driver app, and you can basically order a taxi from your phone and then at the end of the trip pay it, right, as a passenger. And as a driver, you can use your own device and don't need any custom hardware. Nowadays, it's like a standard thing that exists. But um, nine years ago, it was completely new. So the guys, you know, like I said, whenever the Bing was playing, they cheered. Because it was just, you know, five guys in the living room pecking away. This particular guy here, is uh, called Philip, goes by the nickname of Pico, and um, he came straight from university. So his hiring interview went something like, hi, um, do you know how, how to implement stuff on iOS, iPhone OS back then? And he said, no, I actually don't. And they said, hmm, that's, that's bad because we really need an iOS developer. Would you maybe learn it? And he said, yeah, sure, why not? So, you know, this is how they started out. They just, you know, hacked away, basically. Since then, a lot has changed. The, the Bing sound would be this annoying flatline sound in the office, and somebody would turn off the, the speaker. Because we grew a lot. We grew in um, 11 countries all over Europe, in more than 70 cities. Barcelona is one of our biggest markets. And with the ever-growing demand and the growing business, we had to scale the back-end and the, the people, the team size, right? The IT department, or all the departments. Um, so what we want to talk about is basically how we scaled the software, the back-end side of things, and how we scaled the people, how we, how we managed to scale the teams. I think, Tim, now it's a good moment to say, who the hell are we? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me bring up that silly slide of us. So my name is Tim. This guy is called Alejandro. We both are backend developers from the Hamburg office. And we care about the passenger side of things. So we um, implement and extend the, the passenger backend, you know, fix bugs, put some new bugs in, mostly. And um, um, we early on realized if we would not scale our backend with the growing demand, then we would at some point hit a brick wall, right? So what we did, we adopted microservices early on. And um, by the show of hands, who is using microservices in production? Who is planning to maybe? Okay, who doesn't know what a microservice is? Okay, good, okay, you're in the right conference at least. Um, so. We still have some older legacy thing in the middle from the five guys out of the living room or garage. Um, but most of it is already sliced into microservices or the new stuff, of course, is new microservice, basically. We have around 180 microservices nowadays. I know the number is kind of meaningless. It's like giving you the number of lines of code or something, but just so that you get a rough idea of the scale that we're operating at nowadays. Um, all of our stuff runs in Docker containers on AWS ECS, and we handle a couple of million of HTTP requests a minute. So this is where we are right now. But uh, the question I want to talk about is why, why would you go into microservices? Right? Because it has advantages, but it has some big disadvantages. So let me... Um, real quick highlight the two main advantages why we are doing microservices. Because one microservice is independent from another, like most of you people know. Um, you could use different programming languages, different frameworks, different versions of frameworks, different libraries. You could um, choose the, the data store that fits the problem the best, and you can do the individual deployments. At MyTaxi, we don't go crazy with the, um, with the programming languages. All of our stuff is JVM-based. We use a lot of Java, um, nowadays more and more Kotlin, and some insane people here in Barcelona um, use GRUI for whatever reason, at least for coding their tests. Um, 
and it's all Spring-based. Right? We use Spring 4 and 5, Spring Boot 1 and 2, because this is one of the advantages. We don't have to upgrade the whole thing. We can, you know, new stuff do in Spring Boot 2, and the old stuff that is running for years without touching is still Spring 4, but it works quite good, right? So the, the, the second um, advantage, and maybe the, the biggest in our opinion, is the scalability. Like I said, we knew that we had to, to scale with the business, and in the taxi business, you get these um, demand peaks. So in the early morning, in the late afternoon, there's the rush hour, or if there is like a special event, like New Year's Eve is always crazy, we have like 10 times the usual demand. Um, but we use um, Amazon's ECS auto-scaling feature. So whenever demand peaks, new instances are started automatically. You know, Amazon does the heavy, listing, heavy <coughs> lifting, basically. Um, so these are the, the, the most important advantages, in our opinion, but there are drawbacks, right? You have all this overhead. We have the communication overhead between the individual services when they communicate to each other, it adds to the latency. And you have the overhead of running you know, hundreds of JVMs and hundreds of application servers, and you include the, the freaking Guava 60 megabyte library hundreds of times. So there's a lot of overhead. And there's a inconsistencies because we had this nice little monolithic application with the database transactions and then we moved into distributed computing basically with different data stores so you sooner or later you get inconsistencies so what we do is we just embrace them we expect things to be inconsistent if you reach out to read some data it might not be there but since the call can fail in the first place you have to build in fallbacks, right? So these are the, the advantages and disadvantages of moving into microservices. But like I said, we also want to talk about how to scale the teams and the people, and this is what Alejandro uh, will cover, basically. Exactly, my friend. Um, as Tim mentioned, um, back in my taxi, we work as backend developers, but uh, I do half time scrum mastering when I'm free. And um, I got in touch a little bit with how people move around, how people scale, all the new hires, and how do you have to treat them. So, um, as yeah, Steve mentioned in the beginning, we're five people sitting comfortably in a living room, and then uh, back in the, there in Hamburg, and then um, suddenly we needed more people. Okay, so another team joined. Another team joined, then came you know, the marketing people, some designers, and uh, management took this brilliant decision to uh, open a new tech hub in Barcelona, just because of the weather. No, just kidding. I mean, you know, you know the weather is um, not so good in Hamburg, but Barcelona opened. And uh, because it's a really, really, really good tech hub, lots of talented people just like you guys um, are here. I should hold this close to my mouth. And um, yeah lots of features moved over to uh, Barcelona, such as the driver management team, dri in general the whole driver setup of my taxi moved to Barcelona, and we are not just one team, we are now three teams in Barcelona. Um, and spoiler alert, uh, we are gonna open a new tech hub in Berlin, and they are gonna take care of the data um, engineering part of uh, my taxi. Um, anyways, um, so, um, as you heard in the beginning, my taxi started as a German company, and um, yeah, it was just German people, but suddenly we started hiring more people. And then uh, Tunisia came into role, and then Great Britain, Portugal, uh, Romania, Ukraine, Mexico, and at some point we were a bunch of countries just integrated in my taxi, in my taxi environment, in all over the locations. and. Um, this brought diversity, and usually when you have diversity, you have two things, very, very important things that we embrace and like in my taxi, which is innovation and creativity. You just don't have the diversity um, in terms of languages or nationalities, you have diversity because uh, it's culture, uh, uh, lots of things come which are really, really good, and um, we, we like them, we encourage it, and then we, ke we have kept hiring uh, people from all over the world. It's growing a great business nowadays. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, it was like one and a half years ago where I, when I could actually count the number of nationalities with my hands, now that doesn't happen. It's, it's, I, I couldn't just do it, it's crazy. Um, so uh, this, this the growth happened just seamlessly and without any complications. No, right? Um, what is the main purpose of growing a business in terms of people? Um, usually it's manpower, right? Uh, you, you bring boys and girls uh, into the organization and then suddenly you have lots of people which can deliver features much faster, kind of. And um, yeah, um, you have initially uh, one pregnant girl who can deliver a baby in one month, uh, sorry, nine months. And then you have uh, nine women and uh, you expect them to deliver a baby in one month. Obviously, that doesn't happen. So um, you have to be smart in your business, smart enough to scale and not expect that from your developers because, okay, you have the manpower, but there are some drawbacks as well. Just in li like in microservices, you have drawbacks when you grow in terms of people. And uh, one of that uh, drawbacks is the communication overhead. Um, some people in the, I don't know, in the Barcelona office, let's, uh, let's say, says, let's change the driver icon. Some people on the Hamburg office says, uh, let's change the driver icon in the driver app. And another guy says, let's change the driver icon in the driver app next year. And then in the end, it's like, what? Um, yeah, uh, that really happens. And uh, you know, the, the fourth guy might ask, OK, how many beers did we need for Friday? And it's, uh, there, there's a huge communication overhead. You have to have sync meetings. You have to have many, 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 many time invested in that. Um, and it's not just meetings. Uh, it's as well onboarding efforts. Um, we hire people and we hire really good people um, and all of them know their stuff. Uh, we, we make some tests, they know their stuff, but they need some time to get used to the microservices, uh, to our particular microservices, to know which code resides in which one. And uh, yeah, it takes time. Many people underestimate this, but you guys shouldn't. Um, it's really, really time consuming. Um, Another thing really cool that comes with uh, growing teams is uh, if you grow properly and in a smart way, you will have self-organizing teams. One here, one over here, another one. And those self-organizing teams are going to work in a single, complete, well-prepared working unit if you do it smartly. Um, you, you will have your PO. In, in case of my taxi, we work with Scrum. Um, and you will have your PO, you will have your Scrum Master, and your three platforms uh, involved, uh, Android, iOS, and backend, right? And each one of those teams will work as a unit and will be able to deliver features without complications. Um, this is called independence of teams and self-organizing teams. Um, but can you guys spot a problem with that setup? Usually it's like, um, I don't know, like high school when, you know, the, the cool people lie around here and then the uh, tattoo people lie around here and then um, it's, it's kind of like, like high school. And then all the people that are tattooed know a lot about tattoos. So um, you get these knowledge islands formed in your company. It, th that's inevitable. Um, you will have three packages, maybe three microservices, maybe a bunch of microservices in, in each package. And um, lots of people might know about the passenger app. Oh, yeah. And these five microservices are involved. And then you can work with them really, really easy. But afterwards, uh, you might realize that there are not so many people that know about how business accounts interact between each country. As Tim said, we are not just in, in Germany. It's many, many locations. And uh, you will have always your boss factor, right? The guy that knows everything about this single legacy system of years ago, and you haven't had the time to share this knowledge to other people. Um, it it get, gets hard uh, when you have so many people and so many different areas to work on, and you want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, later on, Tim will tell you uh, how, in our own My Taxi way, we minimized uh, those drawbacks. Um, what else do I have for you? Um, well, um, as you could hear in the last few minutes, um, both microservices and teams have advantages and disadvantages, right? Could you spot that both of them had similar uh, buzzwords? Um, when I was talking to Tim, 
early in um, preparing this chat, uh, we said, hey, actually both of them have similar things and, and kind of behave in a similar way, right? Um, for example, in the tech side of things, you have your microservices and you can choose which technology you use in each one. You can use Kotlin, Groovy, uh, Java, whatever you want, and each service will behave independently and then communication will happen seamlessly with other microservices. And then you go to the people part and there might be, you know, th th there's the passenger team and within the passenger team there are sub teams and uh, each team might work with, I don't know, Kanban, Trello, Jira for tracking issues. It's up to the team. Right? This gives lots of independence, both sides, both uh, tech side and people side. Um, and this applies, this independence also applies for failure. If you guys um, open the MyTaxi app, you will call the login service and the login service will call another service and then suddenly you're ready to order, but um, the service that actually delivers how much are you going to pay from going to here to the next party place fails. And um, it fails, but nevertheless, if you're in an independent environment, uh, you will still be able to click the button and order a taxi, pay your ride, and everything goes fine. Um, same thing happens with people. Uh, if someone gets sick in the team, if it, it will obviously reduce the velocity of the team. If someone goes on holidays, if whatever happens, kaput. Um, <laughs> that's a new emoji, yeah, I like it. Um, if something happens, uh, the teams will be independent and they won't have blockers between them, right? Um, what else? Um, ah, this is, this is quite interesting. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, you have your teams as well as your microservices and you would think that uh, all of you guys are doing the same thing. You know, we're doing coding, we're doing microservices and those guys here are doing Kotlin and Java and Groovy and then um, they are organized in different manners, you know, Trello, Jira. And then uh, you, you're standing here and then in the, in the beautiful Java world and then you come all this way to another team, check out the Groovy project, put it back <laughs> and say, anyways, let's go. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that can happen. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we are uh, non, uh, we're resistant to changes, but it might take some time to uh, adapt to other uh, environments, either from the tech side or uh, on the people side. Um, we also mentioned communication overhead in the, in the um, uh, microservice environment. Yes, you will have thousands or millions of HTTP requests flying around, boom, 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 boom. And uh, on the other hand side, People will have lots to say, lots to talk to you. Uh, you will open your calendar and say, oh, maybe if I shorten my lunch three minutes, I will be able to commit a pull request this week. So um, it really gets crazy. And at some point you have to decide which meetings to attend, which meetings not to attend, and what to do with the information that you lose when you um, uh, don't attend some meetings. It's, uh, it's some drawbacks, but as we said, you have to embrace it. You really have to embrace it and deal with it. Um, that happens when you scale. If you have communication, if, if, if it gets too tiring with the emojis, just tell me. I, I probably cannot do anything, but um, uh, you have communication overhead, and uh, of course that leads into decrease in performance, both sides. You have performance on the microservices because there's going to be latency, there's going to be five HTTP requests fired at the same time, which will be aggregated in this service, which will return data to your app. And um, on the people side, it's exactly the same. You have lots of people, you have uh, onboarding efforts, you have to whatever meetings and so on, and then you will not be able to deliver features as fast as you thought. Of course, you have more manpower, you will be able to deliver faster, but um, not as fast as you thought. Um, so this is kind of the theory, you know, like, like the, the, the theoretical part of how um, microservices and growing in teams kind of are similar, and we showed you the drawbacks and the uh, advantages of that. And now it comes, to my opinion, the most inter interesting part of the chat, which is the lessons learned, concrete problems, and how did us at my taxi manage to solve them properly? Okay. No, give me this uh -huh. one only. I like that you call my part the most important part. So 
<coughs> what we are saying is um, there are these advantages and disadvantages with scaling the software and scaling the people, but we do it anyways, right? We do it because we, we need to scale. The business scales, we need to adapt to that. So the question is how can we minimize the disadvantages? And here are some of the, of the lessons we learned along the way. So the first one for you guys at least might be a little bit obvious, but you want, if you have the, the hundreds of microservices, you want one-click deployments, right? This is essential. You want the deployment be as easy as possible, the rollback obviously also, because sometimes you hit the button and then exception skyrocket, so you need to roll back. Um, at MyTaxi, we deploy um, different services each day, so I would say there is no day without a couple of deployments. Uh, sure, we have some services that you know just do their job and are unchanged for longer periods of time, but we deploy a lot, so this should be as easy as possible, so that it's not a burden on the on the developers. Um, what we, what we did to achieve that is we wrote uh, custom plugins for our Bamboo build server. Um, so the, the lesson we learned was you really have to put extra work in to minimize these things early on so that you don't lose too much of your performance. Um, what we do right now is you do the, the one-click deployment and it goes to, it does like a canary deploy, so we deploy only one instance, so it gets a fraction of the traffic, and if it looks okay, so if the developer who monitors the thing thinks it looks okay, then you just, you know, let the custom plugin do its thing and it gets rolled out to the live, uh, to all the live instances. What we don't have, what's on our list, is um, that we have, like, sophisticated integration tests and completely automated rollout, so it would check the metrics if, you know, performance drops or error rates go up, and then do the cancelling and the rollback automatically, or at least stop the rollout. Um, but we're not there yet. But it's a long process, I would say. Another thing with the, um, <coughs> with the, with the um, ever-growing teams and the communication overhead we talked about is we, we needed a way to minimize the communication overhead. So how do you do that? Um, Whenever there is, uh, uh, for example, a bug that needs attention from several teams, like the, uh, let's say, the passenger team, the payment team, and the uh, driver team, we build so-called task forces. So we take people out of each team, and they come together, ideally in one room if it's possible, so, so they have like the closed communication loop. Um, this happened naturally, so when there was a, um, an issue in, in production, People just grabbed the laptop and, you know, sat next to each other. So we, we gave it a name, basically, and promoted the idea. So now we can even do this plan. So if you know you have to, to build this feature in the next sprint, you plan it into all the three teams and then form a, like an ad hoc team, I would say. Another thing we had also related to the, to the growing number of people, we had this thing called um, backend sync. So we, we, all the backend developers from the different teams came together in one room and they um, decided on how we implement stuff, you know, conventions, basically, company-wide or chapter-wide conventions. So we were sitting in the room, awful, um, awful expensive meeting, 60 developers in the room, and then we started arguing, you know, about stuff like, should we use final on all the method parameters? And some guy said, yeah, IntelliJ even has the plugin in its best practice. Let's put final everywhere. And other teams or other you know, guys and girls um, said, it's, it's a lot of noise. I don't like this. You know, Java is too noisy anyways. Why would we do that? And then there were some guys that said, why don't we just use Kotlin? They you just go var or val, and then it's not as noisy. So we realized we cannot agree on company-wide standards anymore. So we basically got rid of it. We got rid of the whole meeting. There is no back-end sync anymore. The, the teams decide for themselves. So nowadays we have a team that does Kotlin only. We have other teams that don't do any Kotlin and still use the final plugin. Um, 
I'm not promoting this. I'm not going to provide the link. Um, and uh, what we do instead of the backend thing, sync is we do a backend meetup. So it's like more like a traditional meetup. The, the people, whoever's interested, comes together, and some of the teams present their way of doing stuff. And if you personally like the idea, you maybe take it to your team and say, hey, the guys are using Kotlin. It looks you know, promising. Should we also look into it? And so on. Um, we, we just agree on a minimal set of rules. We have you know, some requirements. We have, for example, a correlation ID to track a single request through our um, microservice landscape. You know, you can find it in the logs then. So you have to forward the correlation ID, the HTTP header, but how you do it is up to your team, basically. And um, afterwards, we uh, learned that Spotify is doing the same thing, kind of, they call it cross-pollination, like uh, honeybee that, you know, takes the ideas and spreads it to the different teams. Um, next up is this. <laughs> Maybe we went a little bit too crazy with the emojis, but bear with me, I'm, it has a meaning. Um, <laughs> so sometimes um, you realize that your, your microservices are not sliced correctly. Get it? Um, so usually, usually you have a certain feature, and whenever you want to change something about this particular feature, you have to touch two microservices, microservice A and B. You never change just the one, it's always the two, so they seem to belong to each other. So maybe you should merge them or at least slice them in a different way. And on the other hand, sometimes you have this maybe growing too big microservice, and whenever you change just one aspect of it, you have to you know, deploy the whole thing. Um, I have a concrete example for this. We have a service called Passenger Account Service. So it's um, you know, handling the passenger accounts. It's um, saving the, the, the passenger's user details, like your username, your first name, your last name, and so on. And this service is really mission critical for us. We need it when you do a booking. We need it when you open the app just to display the information. And uh, we need it when you sign up for the service in the first place. So this is really, like I said, mission critical. What we also had um, built right in is um, the connection to a third party provider called Concure. You can use it for managing your travel expenses. Right? And whenever Concure had changed something about their API or we um, moved to a new version of their API or something, we had to touch the passenger account service. And with the passenger account service, um, we, we need a lot of people reviewing the pull requests and you, you know, get a little bit nervous when you deploy it because it's one of the critical services. So we, we sliced it differently, right? We did a little refactoring, extracted the concur stuff, and now they are loosely coupled, and you can deploy them individually. But I guess most of you know this already, right? You, the majority of you guys is using microservices. The real lesson learned here is that you should do the same with your teams. Make sure they are sliced correctly. If you realize you have to build a task force like every sprint, then maybe you should slice the teams in a different way. Um, the teams must remain autonomously, like Alejandro explained. And what we witnessed is um, teams are in a certain size and shape for all kinds of reasons. If you have like a big room and a small room, you end up with the big team and the small team. It doesn't make any sense. So you should you know, observe it and then take your time to refactor this stuff. Um, next up, <laughs> another thing, um, we re uh, another problem we had, and I, and I guess all the fast-growing companies have it at some point, we had the meeting room problem. So it was impossible to find a free meeting room, and um, once you had one and you, you went there, the previous meeting is running over time and you have to wait in front like an idiot, basically. Um, so we realized this is something you would uh, avoid in microservices. In, in your microservices, you would not have this shared resource, this common good that can be blocked, right? 
you, you don't want your microservice to use the same database as the next microservice because if that one goes crazy and you know, um, consuming all the resources, your microservice suffers from it. So what we do instead is we have dedicated stuff for all the teams. We have a small meeting area in the team space, like you have your sofa and your TV and you can you know, hook up your laptop and do a planning or refinement or a talk meeting, whatever you need. And we do this with other stuff too. We have dedicated test environments, so every team has its own test environment in AWS. AWS cluster, it's called a cluster, right? Um, you have the overhead of maintaining that thing and keeping it up to date and so on, but <coughs> you never have to wait because some other team broke your test environment. And of course, you want dedicated personnel for all the teams. You don't want to share a product owner between two teams because if one team grabs them, you know, you suffer from it, basically. Another thing we have, and I'm kind of proud of it, is we have really good monitoring and we, we put it up on the wall on big screens and um, um, the, the, the good thing is our monitoring is so good that we usually um, spot issues before customers really, or before a lot of customers are affected and you know the, the um, complaints come in and so on. So uh, we do monitoring and we do, it in, we do it kind of as an alternative for having good tests, I would say. I mean, we have, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, the, it's the choice of the independent teams. They can write as many tests as they want um, to be less nervous while deploying. But actually, it's kind of hard to, to, to do proper testing because you not only need the unit tests and the so-called integration tests where you test the whole microservice down to the you know, data store and back up, or the end-to-end -end tests where you really run multiple microservices and test stuff between them. You also need um, performance tests. You need you know, load testing. So it's a lot of effort that goes into testing. And if you could just um, uh, you know, give it a small fraction of the live traffic, you will learn rather quickly if it's working OK. Right? So we put, l let me rephrase it, we, let <laughs> we put more effort into monitoring than testing. Is this fair to say? OK. <laughs> so um, what we do, we use the ELK stack, so we collect um, logs using Logstash, putting it into Elasticsearch, querying it using Kibana, and use Grafana to, to build the fancy dashboards. And then we do um, alerting on top. We use Elastalert, a product open sourced by Yelp, and it seems like they don't have a proper icon, at least I couldn't find one, so let me know if you know about an icon there. Um, and we alert not only on, on like error rates or exceptions that happen, we also monitor feature usage. So if, for example, um, for half an hour nobody's using our referral feature, we think, hmm, something might be wrong there. Let's, let me you know, check the app. I mean, booking or lo locking functionality would be would be, um, we don't need an alert for this basically because we would know, we would know yeah. But for the, um, for the features that are not used that much, we have alerts in place and if they flatline, if the usage flatlines, we get an alert as well. And um, what we also have in place is an on-call team, so 24 seven, somebody's on call. Some of the poor guys in the audience is currently on call, I believe. Um, and um, we use PagerDuty to manage the on-call team. So you get notified. We really have a, I forgot to bring it on stage, but we have an actual beeper that you have to carry around that goes off if alarm's coming in. So good monitoring and alerting is essential. And when we, when we figured out that we think software and, and people are kind of the same and there are a lot of similarities in between. We asked ourselves, do we also have monitoring for our teams? I mean, do we, do we, like, do you get an alert? Do you see if something is wrong before people, you know, resign or before the, before they are in a bad mood or something? Um, and we actually have 
um, a lot of things in place. What we do is we do one-on-one -on -one meetings. So every week or every, every other week, you have this fixed time slot where you talk to your supervisor. It should not be like a status report or something. You can talk um, about you know, whatever is bothering you or wh whatever you like. I mean, basically give him feedback. We have a so-called pit stops. So every couple of months, you have like a, mm, um, a longer talk. Instead of a half an hour one-on-one, -on -one, you do have like 60 to 90 minutes, and you prepare it beforehand, and you give feedback into both directions. The supervisor is you know, telling you what he thinks you do good and what you could do better, but it also goes the other way around. Um, we also have all-hands meetings where the whole company comes together, or you can uh, watch the live stream, where the CEO and you know, other C-level uh, people tell about the, the, the direction <laughs> the company is heading to so that you know why we decide on implementing a certain feature instead of the other cooler one the developer might like more or something. So you get like the big picture so you know what you are, I mean, why you are doing what you're doing, basically. Um, and we try to do fun stuff. We do after work events and team events and go go hunting and paintball playing. I mean, I will not join the next paintball <laughs> thing, but I went once. Um, <laughs> got my ass kicked, basically. Um, so these are some of the, of the stuff we learned along the way. These are just some examples, but it really helped us to, to think about the whole team structure um, more like you know, engineers would look at, uh, at the software side of things. And we believe that um, you as a, as a I guess, software engineer working in a team should not think that it comes from the outside. It's somebody else is deciding how we slice the teams, right? You usually give feedback, you do retrospectives, I believe, and um, you should tell the guys if you think this is not working okay, if you want to change something, basically. Um, but like I said, these are just some examples. Alejandro, what, what is the main message? Maybe this is the most important part, not not my part. Could be. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, guys, I know that this is a tech conference, and we didn't speak too much about technology, um, but we believe that this message is quite also important. So um, you uh, you just majored in self-organizing teams and growing your teams in your company. I don't know how much deep are you guys into uh, these kind of decisions and stuff, but uh, you have voice and you can tell uh, your Scrum Master, you can tell in the next retro that you would like to implement some, maybe some of those uh, lessons learned. As we said in my taxi, uh, this is our own way of doing things or solving our problems. And we would love to talk to each and every one of you afterwards and uh, if possible and, and learn how you guys do it in your organization. It's, it would be so, so interesting for me and for Tim. Um, so wh what's the takeaway here? Um, we, we are not saying that you should not uh, stay in the monolith. No. If you are a five-person team or a ten-person team, um, it doesn't make sense to have this huge overhead of creating a whole infrastructure for microservices. It doesn't make sense. Just stay with your monolith. Everyone knows everything. No knowledge islands. Everything's cool and nice. Um, uh, but if you have to grow, just grow smartly, try to implement as many of th as, as those things that we, we have suggested, and uh, you will do it smoothly, I can promise. Um, did I miss something? Yeah, we can um, uh, point out Pico, yeah. the, the guy from the beginning who doesn't knew iOS. Exactly. Um, now he's still not knowing iOS, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, no, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, he is the iOS lead developer of my taxi. He, I mean, he knows the application from up top, top to bottom. He's uh, quite amazing. Um, this is uh, on your um, left-hand side. You can see a picture of uh, the Hamburg team. On the right-hand side is a picture of the Barcelona team. We don't have a picture for, um, uh, for Berlin yet, but so welcome. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty much it, guys. We encourage you to ask uh, questions uh, afterwards. We'll stay here for a while. And um, just download the app. Um, it's available in the App Store, in the Play Store. Uh, if you guys are going home or partying tonight, you can use that uh, voucher code. You just have to download it, go to uh, the 
uh, insert voucher code in the menu and um, you will get a 15 euro voucher, uh, 50, euro, 50, 15 euro vouchers, first come, first serve. So, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, guys. Um, yeah, question. You should repeat the question, first of all. Uh, maybe I should give you the uh, <laughs> microphone. So in one of your slides, uh, you mentioned that you use Scrum. Yeah. But uh, m it might be um, that you have a, a strategy to use Agile all throughout your company, tr all throughout your teams. But uh, if you have features to enter in your product, OK, and uh, it, it is across all your teams, do you have something of the sort of Scrum of Scrums? Uh, I mean, uh, something which unifies all the sprints across the whole company. Um, do you want to take it or should I? Yeah, we both can say something about it. And, um, most of the people are using Scrum, but we said they could change to something else. We had a team that was using Kanban for, for, for a certain time. Um, but nearly all the teams just do sprints and they are in sync. So um, the it st starts on a Monday, you know, goes two weeks, and then we have the tech review where all the teams come together and present their, their uh, what they have done basically in the, in the previous sprint. And when we want to build a feature that spans several teams, like I showed, then, you know, you extract the task force kind of, and they then also have the same sprint. So you are in sync basically. Um, yeah, Scrum exactly. of Scrum, basically, we, we have don't not. Have we it. just in sync. Yeah, but that's in the, in the uh, tech uh, huddle, in the in the tech review. Sorry, it's our way of syncing with other teams, basically, and it not just goes for uh, Hamburg. We do it uh, by a Zoom call with all the offices. That's the way we sync uh, at the moment. Does this answer the question, kind of? Yep. Okay. Any other question, guys? Let me pass the mic to you. Yes, the, do you move people uh, among your teams or do you have the same people in, in each team all the time? Uh, usually the team stays together as a team. It's not like we have a pool of people and then form new teams all the time. Um, but recently we had two passenger teams in the, in the Hamburg office, basically the two teams in one of the team where we were working in, mm -hmm. and then new people came in, and at some point we said, it doesn't make any sense, it's getting too big, let's slice them into three. Um, before that, we also rearranged, I mean, it was not long ago, like six weeks ago, three sprints, yeah, exactly. or three, four sprints ago, um, we had, the, the two teams were just built because we had to build these two bigger topics, and one was, involving um, mainly back-end developers and just some front-end, and the other feature was completely the other way around. The, the app guys wanted to change stuff and didn't really need much back-end uh, capacity, so we changed the teams, and then we did the two topics, and now we're changing again. So we're changing every now and then whenever it seems fitting, but we have a fixed team structure, because you usually want the, the guys to do you know team building, kill me in paintball, and then they really they know and like each other and can work together nicer, I would say. Yeah, the thing here is um, uh, take one step back. Uh, don't just go and develop and develop. Take one step back, inspect and adapt. Check what's not working. And uh, as Tim said, don't follow a structure just because your rooms are built that way. That's, that's dumb. Oh yeah, we're changing rooms all the time in that yeah. building. There's always handymen coming in, building walls or ripping yeah. them out. Exactly. Seems really expensive, but yeah. we do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, here in the front. 
Yeah, you mentioned that um, it's necessary to split microservices and teams in a certain way. Could you tell us more how you how you do this uh, in 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 your company? You mean the slicing, how we decide yeah. what should go into a microservice? No, or not? It's like which team is responsible for which microservice? You mean, right? Yeah. Um, the, I mean, if we build a new feature and it looks like it could be easily be an independent microservice, then we just create a new microservice. Should also be one click, I would say, to create a new microservice. We're not there yet. Um, but it should be um, so easy that it's not a factor in the discussion, right? If it makes sense, make it a standalone microservice. Maybe if we discontinue the feature, you can just throw it away or archive it or something. Um, so s slicing the microservice, yeah, we have this rule of thumb, like I said, if you um, change two microservices all the time, they seem to be coupled. If there's this one aspect of this maybe grew too big microservice, then you know, slice it into two parts. And with the teams, it comes more naturally. We have like the, the passenger, um, in the beginning we had one passenger team and one driver team, so whatever was built in the passenger app was passenger team, and they had their own microservices, and the driver side was kind of on the other side. Sure, we had like this one service in the middle where we do the, it handles the booking, and this is kind of the handoff, right? So we um, create the booking, and then <coughs> it finds a driver, so there is this thing in between, kind of a shared service. But um, it, it depended on the topic where it goes to. Yeah. Nowadays, sorry, nowadays we have multiple passenger teams, so it's more like feature teams. Right. So one, we had like GDPR team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah in, and it's not so difficult to slice them. Usually if the microservice has passenger on the name, then it goes to passenger team. It's uh, how, how it works that way. And now uh, every, every team, as they are rotating sometimes, uh, kind of knows in general the, the, the overall functionality of all the microservices which belongs to the passenger team. Um, and it's this thing I showed you about mixing and matching. It's not so easy, but uh, we have to embrace it, and it's nice. I mean, it's, I, I like to know what the other guys are doing. But, uh, I mean, everyone can change stuff everywhere. I mean, if I go and want to change somebody in, in some other microservice, another team's microservice, I would talk to them first. So maybe somebody's in the middle of refactoring, and then we get merge conflict or something. But it's not like they own it and nobody else should touch it. We have you know, permissions to change. Um, we do a feature branch and then I ask the guys in the pull request. Um, and usually I then learn that they do some things a little bit different than the teams I worked uh, in previously. But everybody can change stuff everywhere. It's just that it grew so big that I don't know half of the services anymore. This is the only reason why I don't touch some of them. True. Yeah. Uh, someone else had uh, another question here. Here first. How do you evaluate the usability hypothesis when releasing a new feature? And if something is not expected, how you rethink the um, design of this, uh, the redesign of this release of features? The usability, you mean? Yes, the usability hypothesis, if it is not evaluated as expected, what is the redesign strategy? Uh, whether a feature makes, uh, whether you, it makes sense to um, create a feature in the passenger app and then uh, check whether it works as uh, intended. Yeah, as intended. Like the A-B testing we do, for yeah. example. Yeah. I'm, I'm the, the we have dedicated designer team that you know designing the, the whole look and feel and the, the UX side of things. And they do um, user testing first. So they build like a prototype and their tools. I don't even know what they are using. It's like mock mock prototypes, mm -hmm. and then they the user acceptance tests, and... As, sorry, as a business goal, not as a technical side. Or if, if we earn money with it, you mean? If it makes sense? If yes, yes, if this hypothesis for bringing money it does not work, how do you synchronize the business goal and the technical to match? <coughs> I mean, we, we measure stuff. We, um, we, um, am, I, am I allowed to say user tracking? Now that we <laughs> 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 today is 25th, man, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean we measure stuff. So we, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you consent, if you opt in, then we measure stuff. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a trick. He's a he's yeah, a lawyer. He's a lawyer, not man. an engineer. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we. Um, I mean, beforehand, this is more of the uh, the. Both of us are engineers, so we have like product owners and um, you know people above them, and they think about stuff, and they, the BI guys try to predict certain things, and then we implement features, and afterwards we see if it you know has the, the the effect, and if not, we you know go ahead and change it, and we put a lot of effort into A/B testing, A/B/C testing, even mm. um, we in the past you know some years ago we built in stuff that was a complete failure, I would say. We had this, um, maybe I should not tell too much about the <laughs> great failures. I mean, we built this feature, the drivers hated it. Um, they you know, were coming to the office, said, this is not, you know, guys, this is not how it works. And then we, we changed it. I mean, we threw away, um, you know, a half a year of work and said, okay, we're going back to the old model. Sorry, guys, we should have involved you earlier. And nowadays we have, um, um, we have beta testers, we have drivers that get features earlier, right? And then they try it out, they give us feedback. We are really close to the taxi drivers. It's different from some of the ride-hailing apps you guys might know. We have a really good um, relationship to the taxi drivers. It's different from yeah. non-taxi drivers. We would say we just don't have staging in, uh, in code, but also staging in features and in business, uh, in the business level. Uh, we, we release things early with just l a small amount of people. Yeah, and we do, I mean, I mean we do app releases yeah. um, all the time, right? It's not like crazy changes after one year. So I think it's every four weeks that we release, release a new app. Exactly, yeah. Uh, over here was, uh, is it okay? Yes. Yep. Um. How do you look for uh, new people? I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> not that I'm uh, Talk to us afterwards. but uh, there's al al also always a uh, need for new people and how to examine the new candidates. Uh, what is your process? Like, uh, do the teams decide if they want uh, th this candidate or uh, you have dedicated people for interviews or how do you manage that? Um, we, I mean, first we, display ads on Stack Overflow. This is working great, it's expensive, but working great. And since we went to hire um, internationally, we get a lot of um, applications. Um, and the, the hiring process uh, works that we send out a test and you have to implement something. Um, we have, I mean, we have a test for Android, one for iOS and one for the backend side of things. The the backend thing is a already running Spring application, and you just have to build in a feature. It's like what you do, uh, what you would do if you would work with us. It's not like um, could you uh, implement bubble sort or something, right? Mm -hmm. We do like you have to do some work, and um, then we review the test and we do a video interview where we go through the code and discuss. I mean, engineers like Ali and me, we talk to the candidate till he gets to the next rounds. And what's also important in the hiring process, at some point you get to learn to know the team. So if you are in Hamburg or in Barcelona, you come to the office and you know we talk and uh, go out for lunch together because we really want to make sure it, you are a good team fit, right? It's more than just being a good hacker kind of guy. You also need to be communicative and uh, you know the people need to like you in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most of the times that's a really uh, decisive uh, thing. If you are not a team player, if you uh, don't like to communicate, if you just want to shut yourself in an office and don't talk to anyone, uh, probably it's not the right place for you because we need this communication as we explained. Yeah. But there is a lot of um, you know, brilliant people. We get so many applications and it's our fault that we cannot review them as quickly as we want to and hire and onboard. The onboarding is what takes the the lion's share of time there, I guess. Um, and I mean, the office is too small. I mean, it's not a problem of finding people, I would say. Yeah. If you go global. I don't know how much time do we have. Let me just OK, so sure. So uh, uh, in, basically, you said that all teams are sitting in the same room. So did you have experience also working with remote people? and? Uh, if, if uh, yes or, or not, I mean, what are the problems or 
challenges or, or can it work in, in this company organizational culture? We don't do remote work. I mean, you sure, you every now and then you can, if you have to stay home for whatever reason, you can, you can work, you can do something, but it's not like we have remote employers, employees. Um, I think it would work quite well if everybody is working remotely, but we have, you know, these teams and the guys really s stick together. And then if you the only guy not being there all the time, you kind of the, you, you might get alienated. Yeah. Right? It's you don't want to be in, in, you know. Yeah. And I mean, we have an awesome office. <laughs> I really enjoy going there. I mean, if I, if we had the chance to work remotely, I would still go to the office. It's quite nice. Seems like we'll s we're selling the company too much. Oh, yeah. But this, it this is not about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a PlayStation there, yeah. here, yeah. you know. So, <laughs> um, over there, yes. Uh, Ale, I think we're running out of time. Oh, are we? Okay. Yeah. Uh, she says game over. On oh. the sign. I think that means stop it, please. Okay. Uh, just Thank you, guys. Thank come you, over very guys. Much. Thank you.